Okay, so uh, good morning. My name is uh, Roberto Garay, and I will serve as uh, um, introductory to the to this webinar on innovative disease heating and cooling, and that is colonized between related and the reuse heat uh, AIDS 2020 project. It will be like uh, one hour and a half, and uh, we will also make it available at the end of the conference uh, for all the uh, participants or other people who couldn't mm -hmm. attend the, the webinar as well. And uh, we have organized it uh, with a mixed uh, policy and demonstration site uh, agenda. So uh, at the beginning, we will go with the European Commission and then we'll go uh, through two uh, specific uh, applications uh, to this situation. Program. So first of all, uh, we do have uh, with us uh, Mr. Maris Lannister, who is uh, who works at the, the digital um, linear policy team and the energy efficiency unit in, in Brussels in the, in the European Commission. He is specifically um, responsible for the heating and cooling sectors and cogeneration, and he comes also with an extensive background at the national level in Estonia, where he worked in, in the national energy strategy and the energy and payment plans uh, for several years. So I would like to uh, thank uh, Maris for uh, joining us and just uh, give the floor to him to, to show us how the things come uh, in the near future at the policy level. Yeah, good morning, everyone. So it's a pleasure to be here and I hope I can have the slides on the screen. But uh, yeah, I can start with uh, recalling uh, the, the region of the current proposal of the Energy Efficiency Directive, what I'm supposed to introduce to you this morning. And uh, the origin of this um, uh, idea of uh, revising the Energy Efficiency Directive is the Climate Target Plan that said quite clearly that in order to meet long-term uh, carbon target in the EU, and uh, reduce emissions by 55 percent for the year 2030 we need to also update the energy efficiency and human energy target so there should be more uh, efficient energy consumption and uh, more renewables in the in the eu by year 2030 and uh, i'm coming to talk about the uh, heating and cooling provisions of what has been changed in the uh, recent uh, proposal compared to existing directive. So next slide, please. So basically the architecture of the proposal remains the same, but the provisions have been strengthened uh, and uh, a little bit revised. So what's the, what are the main uh, points in the revision. So first of all, we are revising the requirements for the comprehensive assessments. So these are the assessments by the member states to assess their heating and cooling sector in order to identify the way forward uh, to improve the efficiency of the heating and uh, cooling and also to look at what are the options for the use of high efficiency cogeneration in the member states. So in the future, they will be a part of the national energy and climate plans. So far, they've been standalone documents, but we see that uh, often they have very good technical background and uh, very good uh, scientific information. But uh, what is missing is the link with the uh, policy of the member states and uh, these uh, need to be enhanced in order to exploit this uh, full potential of the, uh, these plans and uh, also to see them, uh, the changes on the ground. And the second important point in the, in the, in the revision is that the, the implementation of cost the measures uh, becomes um, mandatory from, for the member states and the member states have to ensure that the implementation of cost efficient uh, measures takes place. Uh, the third important point from the um, aspect of uh, long-term planning of the heating and cooling sector is that uh, we should uh, specifically target the large municipalities and administrative units where the population is higher than 50,000. And in those uh, locations, we would like to see that member states uh, encourage 
taking the actions on the ground and uh, also the local level uh, heating and cooling plans are developed uh, to define what's the way for, forward uh, to decarbonize the heating and cooling sector and uh, introducing renewables and uh, making the systems uh, more energy efficient. Next slide, please. Uh, there will be a revised uh, definition of the efficient uh, district heating and cooling. So the current definition that says that at least 50% uh, uh, renewables, at uh, least 50% waste heat or 75% co-generation heat uh, needs to be strengthened in order to give um, right momentum for the decarbonization of the uh, district heating and cooling systems. So as of the year 2026, the definition becomes stricter and uh, particularly from the co-generation perspective. Instead of uh, regular co-generation, we require that uh, the heat should come from the high efficiency co-generation. And the second important point is that uh, a share of the heat, namely 5%, should uh, come from the renewable energy sources. So, so the yeah, definition of the high efficiency cogeneration is also quite important and uh, I will talk later what's, what's this um, going to be in the next years ahead. From year 2035, we are not um, defining the ro role of uh, high efficiency cogeneration in the efficient district heating and cooling systems. So there, after we have proposed that uh, the share of uh, renewables should uh, renewables and waste heat should increase gradually, and uh, after certain points in time, the definition will be strengthened up till 2050, when the the requirement is that uh, efficient district heating and cooling may contain or, or may supply the heat that, that comes from the renewables and uh, or waste heat and the share of waste uh, renewables should be at least 60 uh, percent so the next slide please <clears throat> so the criteria for the efficient district heating and cooling uh, uh, systems will apply when the systems will start their operation after the after construction or refurbishment so it's so it's it's the point when the compliance with the definition will be assessed and uh, this is particularly important for the support uh, schemes or state data member states to commit or any other body is issuing for the for the efficient district heating and cooling systems or high efficiency cogeneration. So this has to be met uh, at those points where the, uh, where the system starts the operation. So year after year, the conditions will be stricter, but the point when the installation starts its operation is the critical one. And then this point uh, requirements should be met. So there will be also a requirement for all the district heating systems that are above five megawatts. And uh, these uh, need to be ha having a plan for conversion of those systems into efficient district heating and cooling systems from year 2025. So it uh, doesn't oblige the owners of the, or operators of the district heating and cooling systems to, to be the efficient district heating and cooling systems, but uh, there should be planning in place what could be the way ahead uh, in order to meet the standards of uh, efficient district heating and cooling. And finally, also the cost benefit uh, analysis um, and cost benefit assessment of individual installations are revised. And there will be lower limit for the installations that should be subject to cost benefit analysis. Instead of 20 megawatts, it will be five megawatts and the new type of installations included under these provisions will be the data centers. So ITC sector is quite important um, 
energy consumer at the moment there are large uh, installations uh, in several locations around the europe and there will be new ones and therefore we would like to see that ict sector is uh, looking at options whether the waste heat or residual heat coming from the installations is um, effectively used when it has sufficient potential for the use in um, other uh, areas needing heating and cooling and the next slide please so the revised definition of the cogeneration will contain a provision that uh, all the cogeneration facilities uh, starting their operation after the introduction of the directive will or should meet the uh, emissions um, specific emissions criterion and uh, this is 20 uh, 270 grams co2 per one kilowatt hour of energy output uh, so meaning that uh, mechanical energy electrical energy and uh, heat will be assessed uh, per the uh, uh, will be taken into account when calculating the specific emissions level for the installation. And basically this uh, limit means that uh, no other fossil fuel plants than the natural gas plants are able to meet uh, uh, specific emissions uh, limit criterion. And uh, one important provision under the definition of high efficiency cogeneration is that uh, there shouldn't be increase of the um, other fossil fuels than natural gas in the um, in those systems that are supplied from the uh, high efficiency cogeneration. So we don't want to see indirect um, increase of the contribution of. Uh, other fossil fuels than natural gas in those systems that are currently using uh, high efficiency cogeneration as the heating source in the district heating systems. So next slide, please. So one I, fact that I wanted to draw your attention to was uh, that um, we are currently receiving from the member states what are the long-term plans in the heating and cooling sectors for this purpose the comprehensive assessments are made in the member states and as of to today we have received uh, those plans from 20 member states and in total 85 percent of the total energy market in EU is covered with with those plans you can say that so member states are planning to the steps towards the uh, decarbonizing and uh, the heating and cooling systems and uh, introducing more renewables in and uh, and energy efficiency in their heating and cooling sector all the plans uh, that are received are published in the european commission specific website and the link is given here so that was my final slide and thank you for the attention today. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Lannister. Thank you for the for the introduction to the plans of the European Commission for the, for the coming years. Uh, it's actually challenging uh, to see how renewables will increase in, in until in the, in the coming decades and also considering the large scale of uh, heating systems in Europe, it will be a, a real challenge uh, for, for the systems to, to get in line with that. So that gives us the floor to the second part of the, of the webinar where we will have uh, two really senior engineers uh, discussing on the practicalities on how to bring this to, the, to their systems. Um, so first of all, we will go uh, to see how people in Belgrade are uh, improving their system. And for that, we do have uh, uh, Dr. Savic, uh, who is uh, executive director of the of uh, Electrone, the, the district heating network serving the city of Belgrade. Um, and who has been in, engaged in, in improving their systems in the last uh, 30 years. Uh, both uh, from uh, in the implementation of research uh, project, but also getting investments from uh, from uh, uh, development banks into the system to to invest in renewables and, and change substantially the mix of the, the system. 
So, uh, Ramilo, please, the, the floor is yours. Um, let us know how, what are you doing there. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, good morning to everyone. And regards uh, from Belgrade. Uh, I will immediately go to my presentation. Just give me a few seconds to share the Hope everything is okay. Uh, so, some technical problem, just a second, please. Yeah. We can see your slide, yeah. Yes, it's okay. I just want to say one more time, uh, regards from uh, Belgrade, capital of uh, Serbia, uh, city of uh, two, uh, thousand, uh, 2 million of inhabitants, and of course, a lot of job for my company uh, to hit during the winter. Uh, practically, we are cover more than 50% of uh, the town, and uh, in numbers, it looks like this. We have uh, 14 big and 22 uh, uh, smaller uh, heating plants. Uh, total capacity is uh, more than 300,000 megawatts. Uh, 3,000 megawatts, sorry. Uh, our uh, pipes under the city is uh, around uh, 1,500 kilometers. It's uh, two pipe systems, more than 9,000 uh, substations. All of those uh, modernized and put on automatic in the last 20 years. Area uh, which we hit uh, uh, on the side of our consumers is 22.5 million of square meter and uh, around uh, 330,000 uh, flats are connected directly to the system. Our annual production is, uh, is uh, 3.7 terawatts hour per year, more than 2,000 employees. And we are still growing with uh, average uh, 1% per year. Also, interesting data is that we practically depending of natural gas, more than 92% of our primary fuel is natural gas. Uh, we still have some local boiler stations operating on heavy fuel oil. And in the next uh, few years, uh, we will do our best to shut down all of those. And we have some solid fuels, less than 1%. Uh, half of that is uh, solid woody biomass. Uh, in the past 15 years, uh, we have uh, several projects, uh, also uh, from uh, Horizon 2020 uh, package. Uh, to be uh, precise, uh, four uh, projects are uh, finished and uh, this project related is practically at the end and we just start one new. Uh, all of those projects uh, concern energy efficiency, renewable energy sources and all other uh, main things uh, connecting to the savings uh, in the district heating system on production side, distribution side, and also on the consumer side. So uh, on uh, this picture, uh, you can see the concept of related uh, projects when we try to uh, lower uh, the outlet temperature in the network. Also, one of our goals is uh, to make a local decentralization of uh, grid. Uh, every building, uh, even in uh, new parts, have some critical points in the building, some uh, flats or some parts of the building uh, 
usually far from the substations. So we have to identify all of those critical points. Uh, also, uh, our intention is to increase the share of energy from uh, the low temperature uh, sources and to use heat solar collectors and uh, heat pumps. On the multi-axis diagram, uh, this project is somewhere left on the middle. Uh, according to the production capacity, performance, cost of the heat, and the temperature. Uh, in Belgrade, uh, in the north part, we have um, uh, one pilot location, which is consists of two uh, parts. First is uh, location on address you can see on the screen. And it's five, uh, it consists of five residential blocks uh, from uh, five to nine uh, floors. Uh, and the, our main project goal uh, for, uh, in uh, this part of pilot site is uh, to make a conversation of uh, district heating, existing district heating network to low temperature network and uh, also to make some application of the solar heating uh, directly to our system. Some pictures of uh, buildings. Uh, buildings are uh, built in um, 1985. So it's rather old building. And this is uh, the scheme of our internal grid. Previously, before this project, uh, there was uh, one uh, big substation and a local uh, network to all other uh, buildings. Now, after uh, reconstruction, uh, practically each building has uh, itself, uh, for itself uh, a small uh, substation and we succeed to lower the uh, temperature in this second ring. Uh, installed power in the consumer side is uh, 1,100 kilowatts uh, for heating. And also uh, in this part, we have domestic hot water. It's almost uh, 300 kilowatts. Uh, implemented activity in these buildings is to replace uh, of uh, existing uh, equipment, uh, for example, uh, old type uh, tubular heat exchanger uh, and replace with a new generation of plate. Uh, separation of each building uh, by individual measures and uh, to let the consumers to have a control of the consumption. Also increase the flow in the secondary uh, network uh, with the outlet temperature is lowering and to verifying uh, by continuous temperature measures in critical apartments. Uh, also, we make uh, several analysis and uh, models about uh, heat demand, energy demand. Uh, 200 meters from this location, this block of the residential building, there is a primary school called United Nations uh, School. You can see uh, Google uh, from Google uh, perspective uh, the several buildings which is be uh, belong to the school, and this is few nice photos. Uh, practically, the school is uh, the, sa the same, uh, have the same age as uh, the buildings. Uh, substation was out of age, and uh, practically, we put a brain uh, new equipment for all technical uh, uh, parts of, of the school, ex of course, ex except some pipes and uh, radiators. Uh, here, 
we installed uh, two-phase substations uh, uh, which combine solar and our district heating uh, network. Uh, that is uh, somehow implementation of uh, new technology here in Belgrade. And also we install uh, solar panels of east-facing uh, sloped roof. Uh, about heat reduction, uh, uh, we put some thermostatic uh, valves on all radiators, radiators in uh, inside of school, and uh, school take. It's not uh, within the project, but uh, the school uh, take this opportunity for a construction and uh, by themselves they uh, make a window re replacement. So it means we reduce uh, needs uh, for for heating and energy. Uh, the similar uh, uh, installed power around 1,500 uh, megawatts, both the radiators, air heating, and uh, domestic hot water. This is some scheme of uh, heating, new heating substation. And in practice, it looked like this. We put some uh, solar on the roof, put uh, directly uh, uh, pipes uh, to the uh, substation. And uh, the priority is that uh, internal usage of uh, domestic hot water uh, will covered by solar energy when it's uh, available. If they have some uh, surplus, it will uh, go during the heating season to uh, radiator heating and also air heating. And we are that, but in theoretical, if there are some more surplus, they will uh, put in, in a substation directly back to our system. So uh, in the case uh, where is uh, no solar energy, all uh, needs, uh, for uh, the thermal energy will be covered uh, as usual from district heating system. Some pictures for from uh, construction construction work of solar panels of the roof. Uh, Eighty square meters of solar panels is now on that building, and some picture of uh, in, uh, about reconstruction of the substations. That was all for uh, now. If you have any questions, I will be glad to answer. Roberto. Thank you, Ramila, for the for the presentation. It's been really nice to see your progress in in related and in of course in the other projects uh, in the great so my question is uh, once you achieve the reduction of temperature in, in in networks and also you increase the local solar production in, in the school, for instance. What are your next steps? So what is uh, Beogrask Electrone worried about uh, in the coming 10, 15, 20 years? Uh, first, uh, it's very important uh, project for us. Uh, first of kind that uh, uh, solar energy on the side of the consumers will be transferred uh, directly to our system. Uh, the model is very simple. We will not, uh, they will not charge uh, to us uh, their solar heat, but we will reduce uh, their uh, bill from uh, use, uh, used our uh, energy uh, kilowatt hour per kilowatt hour. So it will be compensation. Uh, it's interesting during the summer, that school is will be empty, no uh, no uh, consumption uh, of uh, domestic hot water, and of course no no heating during the the summer, and uh, the production will be at the maximum. So all other buildings surrounding the school uh, have domestic hot water, and practically they will use solar uh, prepared uh, the domestic hot water from the school and. Uh, uh, some part of our uh, from gas boilers. So uh, it's very interesting as a model. Uh, 
that uh, area has around uh, five megawatts in installed capacity uh, for domestic hot water. Practically, uh, uh, during a period from, uh, let's say, April, May till October, if every third building install such system, they will, uh, they can share uh, among themselves and uh, district heating water will be just reserved for night or something. So it's very interesting project. We will very carefully analyze uh, the data we, which we receive from this and try uh, to uh, spread it out to other buildings and also to other areas in the Belgrade. So that is uh, the first step. Uh, also, our intention is uh, to uh, make some more uh, renewable energy sources implementing in the district heating system. Uh, the biggest project now is uh, ongoing uh, and hopefully next year we will receive a first uh, megawatt hour of thermal energy is a waste incineration plan, plant uh, on the south of the uh, city uh, in the suburban area. Uh, about 11 kilometers of uh, piping uh, is already under construction and uh, uh, waste incineration plant will give around 70 uh, megawatts thermal uh, directly uh, to our nearest heat source which will distribute energy to the network. So of course, that uh, heating source is installed capacity of uh, 232 megawatts, but uh, uh, for 70% uh, of, uh, of the winter period, it will be enough with continuously heating to cover uh, the needs of our consumer. And also, uh, we are now in uh, preparation uh, of some more projects to use uh, solar heat uh, uh, in combination uh, with uh, boilers for solid biomass, uh, biomass uh, to heat uh, one totally new area. So it means to uh, build a plant from ground level, which will uh, use uh, uh, several uh, renewable energy sources, biomass boiler, uh, heat pump, and uh, solar. And to make some combination, it will be around uh, five megawatts, but it's still on long-term plans for us. Okay, thank you, uh, Radmilo. It's been uh, nice to see that you are working at uh, multi-scale level. So uh, on one side, on distributing, uh, on distributed solar thermal systems and at building level, but also at, uh, at bigger investments like this incineration plant. And I know that we do have many other investments in the course as well. And also to see that this recruiting is expanding, that you're still planning for new areas where you are trying to push innovative and uh, decarbonized heat sources. So uh, I wish you the best and to, to see, I wish you that uh, 10, 15 years from now, uh, the rate is still warm. Uh, at least inside the, the, the apartments and the houses, and um, that it, it requires much less carbon to, to get that uh, heat into the, into the buildings. So thank you very much for your, for your presentation, Carmilla. Thank you, Roberto. And, and now we are going to, uh, to uh, we are um, inviting Mr. Carl o Oxner, um, who will, complement the, the, the view of a distributing operator like uh, Radmilo with the opinion of a heat pump manufacturer. So how we integrate uh, different uh, technologies into the network and how these technologies fit into these particular applications. So uh, Mr. Ochner uh, is also a really senior. He has been uh, uh, with his uh, Ochner warmer pump and Sorry for my German, it's not perfect, sorry for that. Uh, so um, Mr. Ogner has been uh, pushing his technology with the, uh, his own company for more than 40 years. Uh, he has led research uh, topics on heat pumps and also written many books on this topic. 
And he has also been engaged into the promotion of heat pumps, uh, both in the Ocean Heat Pump Association and also in the European Heat Pump Associations for, for more than a, a decade. And he is here to present uh, how they implemented the heat pumps over the Edmonton uh, site in, in Berlin. And I'm sure that it will be really interesting. So Mr. Ochner, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for having me. Okay. Okay, thank you, Roberto. Um, uh, I'm, um, I will present um, a project in Berlin, um, which is realized um, with the EU project Reused Heat. And I will, I will now show this on the screen. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Carl, can you hear us? Yes. Yes, we are seeing your screen now. Can, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, we, the, the task was to install a heat pump in a metro system, in a metro network. Um, at first, with this reuse heat program, a heat pump should have been installed in the Bucharest subway system, but um, this uh, member of the consortium quit. And so I was asked, why don't I uh, look for possibilities in Berlin to implement a heat pump in the system in Berlin? So, sorry, first Carl, we had to, yes? Carl, sorry, uh, we, we can see your PowerPoint uh, screen, but not, not in presenter mode. We are seeing the... the... We are seeing like the, the slides Sorry. on the side. You see it now? Uh, we are seeing, but I mean, we are seeing like the, the five slides on the side and the, and the editing. Better no. now? Yes, now it's okay. Okay, good. Thanks for helping me. Uh, now, we had to find a location in Berlin. Uh, this was not very easy um, because there are various possibilities. I will then show you which ones. Then the first we selected was the location Ernst Reuter Platz, where we planned the complete installation of a direct expansion heat pump system. Then this station was rebuilt after we have made all the planning so we had to look after a new one at the Frankfurter Allee and to look for a different system because the, the, the um, buildings were different and uh, the problems we had to overcome is rules and regulations and bureaucracy uh, within the subway systems. This, this was more or less the lessons learned. Now, when we looked for an adequate place to install a heat pump. We have been in many, several subway stations and several tunnels. Um, one, in some places, it would have been possible to install the heat pump between the rails. In other options, it was um, considered to install the heat pump next to the entrance because we have the room also with a higher temperature to in the stations. Uh, and after all, we selected them here. In blue, you see the system of the Ernst Reuter Platz with one, two, three, four, five entrances. And we looked and, and neighboring the, the gray building next to it at the right hand side, 
is the technical university because you always have to find number one, a place where to install the heat pump. Number two, where is the heat user? Is there a district heating network when you can connect directly or is there a major user which you can supply with heat? In this case, we selected the technical university and looked around in this gray building complex where could we deliver the heat to. Uh, we have then next to the station seen several side rooms, rooms for, for uh, work, rooms for equipment, and some rooms have been vacant. And so we located one of the rooms suitable to install the heat pump. Um, this is a, a, a view of the room. You see here at the top the heat pump and also the so-called evaporator. The evaporator uses the with several openings. We would have installed ventilators, fans in these openings, so that in this room, which you see here uh, in this blue, uh, behind the blue wall, there would have been the same air, this temperature as in the tunnel, so that we can use this as heat source. This would have been the system which we have planned. At the left-hand side, you see the evaporator, taking the air and cooling down the air. The air temperature in the tunnel would vary in between 15 to 27 degrees. And an issue in Berlin is that compared to London, the subway of London is very uh, let us say um, very deep in the ground. And so the subway, which is next to the surface, but here in the middle, the heat pump which generates the heat. In this case, we selected a 44 kilowatt unit. Uh, we could not manage to plan a larger unit with let us say two or 300 kilowatt because the room was not big enough and also the heat user could not use so much heat in the uh, university. We, we looked at university at some special places where to deliver the heat into. Try to make the next picture doesn't work. Sorry. Now, th this is the evaporator that would uh, take the energy out of the air with two fans and a lamella package into it with, um, uh, a, a, with, with a fan coil and low uh, speed fans. This I've seen already. Yeah, unfortunately, this project had to be stopped because all the metro station was suddenly reconstructed. So we looked for a different, a new location. And we have found a new location, what you see here at the left side at the Frankfurter Allee, where between the rails, we can place the heat source, the fence. And uh, the, 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 but the heat pump we could not install here, but 100 meters away in the building. Uh, you, at the right hand side, side, you see the tunnel between these rails and the building. Um, here is the electricity supply going through this tunnel. You see the cables. And here we will install 
the water lines which supply the source water to the heat pump is some 100 meters long. This is the building, the Gleichrechter Werk from the Berliner Verkehrsbetriebe, which we will heat. This building is heated today with direct electricity. So uh, let us say very high CO2 emission. And um, in the basement of this building, the heat pump will be installed. Here you see uh, the, the sketch at the left hand side between the rails, the heat recuperator, then the tunnel. The tunnel uh, makes very difficulties because sometimes it's very small. And then at the right hand side, you see in the uh, in the uh, let us say ground floor, the heat pump will be installed and all the building will be heated. This is the, the sketch of the system, the hydraulic sketch. On the left hand side, you see the ventilators uh, and the fan coils that take the here in blue, and then next to the heat pump itself. In this place, in this case, we have planned the Aqua 45 because this size was suitable for the building we will heat. And at the right hand side, you see the, the hot buffer tank. From there, the heating grid of the Verkehrsbetriebe um, building. <coughs> Sorry will be heated. Now, uh, the challenge we have to overcome is we have access to the rooms between the rails only between one o'clock and three o'clock during the night, because at these times there is no trains running. And uh, of course, to transport the, the, the machines and the units in, into this place, is very difficult, limited, and we have to have two supervising um, people from the BVG to protect everything. So the installation is, uh, let us say, not easy and very costly. Um, the lessons learned. When you want to install heat pumps in metal systems, we find many, many possibilities because we have uh, in many cities in Europe, metro systems and, and many, many stations. But it is not easy to find the right place where to install a heat pump. In this case, here you see a large heat pump with several hundred kilowatt. And to find a nearby um, heat, a district heating line where we can fit in or a building complex where we will fit in. And, um, Therefore, it needs a lot of let us lot of time and expertise for planning a system. But we can say there is a potential, and I think in the future we do have to use these potentials. Thank you, Carl, for the for the presentation on on your. Uh, endeavor to 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 introduce uh, heat pumps in in metro systems you started in in uh, in one place and you only found uh, another one which was not possible and then this third one so that uh, talks about uh, the difficulty to to finally reach um, 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 a successful uh, installation um so uh, i wanted to ask you a couple of questions um, yeah. so First of all, I mean, you build over an existing uh, train or subway or metro station. How much heat can you take out of a single location? Is uh, there well, limitation there? Uh, well, we the, the limitation of heat, um, we we will not really be able to monitor because the heat map is comparatively small to what the heat supply from the trains is. 
I assume that we, we could use several hundred kilowatt heat source, but we have to find a place where to supply the heat into. In this case, we have first uh, selected a 100 kilowatt, 100 kilowatt heat pump, but um, with the discussions with the heat user and the energy provider, in this case, Vattenfall, they decided, no, we wanted a smaller heat pump, uh, for the building alone, and we can then at a later stage install a second and a third heat pump to use, let us say, uh, two or three hundred kilowatt. Uh, so it's it's um, more or less in this case a commercial question. The technical question is that we have many sites where we can install heat pumps with several hundred kilowatt heating capacity. Okay, so then the 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 limitation doesn't come from the energy uh, point of view, but it, it comes from, from business or from uh, maybe even geometrical uh, questions on where to locate the pumps and where the, the final uh, use of the heat uh, is located. That was we have learned in, 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 in our case. Okay. And also another question I have seen that you do have um, different performance levels depending on, the, on, on its case. And that one of your systems was meant to produce heat in the range of 60 degrees. Um, do you see an increased market uh, when networks or, or building services go lower in temperature level? Is it a, a clear advantage for you? Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, I had an interruption. I didn't get the question. Yeah, so my, my question is that, um, I mean, your, your heat pumps now are supplying in the range of 60 degrees in some of the, the, the drawings you showed us. Um, shall the system go lower in temperature with this uh, fourth uh, generation uh, district heating or uh, ultra low temperature uh, heating in buildings? Will that suppose a real advantage in uh, to you as a heat pump supplier or installer to, to promote the technology as well? Yeah, in, in this case, we, we selected this heat pump um, due to the conditions there. In our program, we have heat pumps up for 1.6 megawatt and up to 130 degrees temperature. So we could, we, we could installing such a heat pump, feed into a district heating line with 130 degrees even, or a standard heat pump um, with, uh, 80 or 90 degrees. And uh, I would have preferred to install a larger heat pump with 80 or 90 degrees into the, into the subway system, but we did not find uh, uh, within the limited budget we had um, the right location. And so it's, it's just a question of, of budget and time. But theoretically, we can easily go to, let us say, 90 degrees, one step heat pumps, we have someone who will allow us to implement and uh, uh, use the energy. Okay, that, that's, that's great. Um, so I could, I could, I could, uh, yeah, I could see us show you some graphs, but I think that the time is here limited, but I could show you several graphs of many installations uh, because it doesn't um, it doesn't matter if you take the air uh, from anywhere or in the subway. It's always a very similar system. The problem here is only the location, the access, and <laughs> the circumstances. Okay, I, it's good to see that uh, that you are. Uh, pushing forward very interesting uh, systems and um, that hopefully they will help uh, district heating uh, systems and also uh, building installation owners to, to improve the, the carbon footprint or to reduce the carbon footprint. And also to that will also facilitate the, the path uh, towards the carbonized uh, heating systems like the ones uh, proposed or, or uh, pursued by the EU policy. So uh, I think that we have had a really uh, interesting uh, overview of the situation. Uh, so we, we have gone through the policy, 
the system operator perspective uh, um, as well and also uh, on the technology provider side um so i would like uh, all the speakers to, to thank all the speakers to, uh, for their presentations it's they have been really useful and i hope that it have been useful as well for the audience and thank everybody for attending the meeting we have had uh, in excess of 50 participants at some moment in the in the in the webinar um and uh, then I, I would close the the session or the the, the webinar today and hopefully uh, we will uh, have uh, further opportunities uh, to present uh, technical interesting uh, problems in the future so thank you all for attending and i hope that you have a, a really nice day today thank you